we know that we're entering a phase of human history unlike anything that came before. Not just the rate of technological change, although that's massive. The advent of artificial intelligence is a game changer for all sorts of reasons that we've covered here on this channel recently. And the power that we have to shape and impact our world, of course, we have filled this finite space like never before. And we still don't quite know how to do that without trashing the place. But also other factors, like the fact that populations in many countries have stopped growing. And that means that they are ageing and soon to begin actually declining. We've never seen that before. And it does mean that things will be very different. How do you have a thriving economy with a shrinking society? And there's one technology stroke demographic element we just haven't talked about yet, but is poised to make as big a change to the human race as anything we've seen to date. And that is the huge amount of resource being poured into solving the puzzle of human longevity. There are billionaires who would like to live forever, or at least for lifespans measured in hundreds, not tens of years. They believe the technology can absolutely solve the problem of ageing, and they're pouring vast amounts of money into new companies who are working on the ways to bring it about. But what is the state of science on this, and does it support their optimism? And also, actually... Just how destabilising would success be to what it means to be a human being? What might be the unintended consequences? That's what we're going to talk about in this video. This is Altos Labs. It's a well-funded startup company that is reportedly pursuing biological reprogramming technology, looking at ways to rejuvenate animal cells with the ultimate aim of prolonging human life. Jeff Bezos of Amazon is a major investor in the company. It also has some of the top scientific leaders in the field on its roster. It can afford them. This is Calico Labs, similarly well-funded, similarly working on longevity issues. Google is an investor thanks to Larry Page's personal interest. And here's Lineage Cell Therapeutics, backed by BlackRock, Raffles Capital Management and Wells Fargo. Then there's this guy, Brian Johnson, the founder and chief executive of brain technology company Kernel. He's better known for being the billionaire who is undergoing a personal experiment with his own body, trying to boost his life using the current state of technology. He has a team of 30 scientists monitoring and measuring every organ in his body, trying out various routines and processes and treatments to keep each of them as young and vital as possible and recording the results. He has popularised his Blueprint Protocol, which is an extreme diet where every single calorie comes courtesy of the most highly rated nutritional foods, and the quantity of calories is lower than most would consider essential because calorific deficit is supposed to be a benefit. An extreme physical regime with daily exercise that keeps in a, in athletic level physical shape. And a truly extreme supplement regime taking approaching 100 pills daily, including just about anything and everything reasonably supported by the current state of the science along with a few more speculative additions. He enjoys notoriety and attention, so he plays up to it. You might have heard of him when he publicised that his son was donating him some of his blood, as he was donating some of his own to his aged father. He played up to the idea that his son was his blood boy, and that duly succeeded in getting all the sorts of headlines that you would expect. Interestingly, he didn't repeat that operation with his son's blood because the measurements apparently showed that in his case it didn't work. Recently, though, he reported that it did show apparent benefit for his aged father. 
how long a lasting effect that might be, still to be seen. Now, why are all these people, Jeff Bezos, all of them, taking this stuff so seriously? Is it a question of too much money and too little common sense? Or are we in the early stages of something we really might not have seen coming, but these people have? I first became aware of the agenda for two reasons. One, I read a popular book by one of the leading scientists in this area, Dr David Sinclair. Two, I became aware of the studies around the so-called blue zones, a handful of places on the earth where humans routinely live longer and where you can find more centenarians, people who live to 100 years or longer, than anywhere else. David Sinclair talked about some of his early experiments in finding molecules that extend lifespan as well as health span in some of the model animals that you have to use in this sort of research. And yes, you do have to use them. You want animals whose physical mechanisms have some cellular similarities to ours, but much shorter natural lifespans. Because obviously you can't easily show an impact on lifespan if you're working with creatures that live for decades, and it's going to take that long before you see any kind of an impact. He championed a molecule called resveratrol, one of the many polyphenols found in red wine. He published the results of experiments showing that this extended the lifespans of mice, amongst other things, which prompted a flurry of news stories around how drinking red wine would help you to live a long life. He also championed another molecule known by the acronym NMN and this boosted a cellular component that deteriorates with age. Sinclair declared that he personally was taking both of these as supplements, as was his own father, who he attested had regained a new vigour for life. Apparently, as a result, he doesn't, he's a scientist, so he doesn't claim proof of causation. Sinclair is also one of those most excited about other technologies that potentially can rejuvenate cells. We may think that cells just gradually get old, the information contained within them becomes corrupted, and there's not much you can do about it. However, the successful cloning of animals decades ago showed that actually this wasn't the case. Think about it. If a baby sheep can be cloned from an adult sheep, but be born as a baby and go on to have a normal lifespan for its species, then it showed that the old cells that were cloned still contained all of the information required to create youthful ones. So theoretically could use that information to go back to that state. That fact was the start of a very long consequential chain that brings us to where we are today. David Sinclair posited that given the speed of breakthroughs that he's seeing around him and in the literature, we are not so far away from the point where you would be able to get an appointment, have your cells rejuvenated and walk out literally 10 years younger. Now, I was into this. I'm of a certain age and I have no interest in retiring or slowing down. I mean, ever, really but certainly not on a time scale measured in decades. So I really paid close attention. But what have I said repeatedly on this channel? Always, and I mean always, treat the things that you really want to believe with the most scepticism. So I did a bit of background research on all of this, and it turns out that Dr David Sinclair while he is one of the most published experts in his field and he has been hugely influential, well, he's also quite a controversial figure. He's accused by some of being unrealistically over-optimistic about the speed of progress and some of the calls that he's made to date in his research. That molecule I mentioned, resveratrol, turns out that other scientists have found it impossible to replicate the results that Sinclair reported in terms of benefit to animal lifespans from resveratrol. Indeed, GlaxoSmithKline bought up Sinclair's resveratrol-focused company, hoping to commercialise this promising new technology. 
only to shut the unit down after a few years, when apparently they couldn't get the results that they were hoping for. And while there are a number of people excited about the potential of regenerative technologies and a lot of work going into it, quite a few sober souls are saying that if they can be made to work at all, it's still a lot longer off into the future from what can be achieved today. Too late for the likes of me, then, I'm guessing. Damn it. So, like all of these things, you will get real research and potential breakthroughs mixed in with a bunch of hype and wishful thinking, and it can be hard for non-scientists amongst us to be clear which is which. I think all you can really do until the breakthroughs are reliably reported and validated is to revert to that other influence I mentioned, the Blue Zones. The short version of the Blue Zones. Blue Zones, there's a handful of places, five places in the world, usually geographically remote for some reason, usually with relatively poor but not impoverished communities. There is one exception, but I'm not going to go into that. They see longer lifespans that are healthy to the end. Now, look, if you offered me a full and active life up until the age of 100 right now, yeah, I'd take that. So why do the Blue Zones work? Well, the researchers who wrote the book and wrote the diet book and made the documentary on Netflix, they came up with a number of things that were distinctive to the communities that they studied. And they suggested a number of things. Really, though, it came down, as far as I could see, to just consistently healthy habits. These were communities where people cooked food grown locally from fresh because it's kind of all they had access to. They were ones where the natural diet tended to be a healthy one just by default. They lived in a place where they had to be active all the time, both because of the types of work that were available and because of all the hills in the place meant that they were doing a lot more climbing. They lived in places that were unpolluted, and I'm sure that helped, no doubt. Oh, and interestingly, in three out of the five anyway, they had a culture of red wine drinking. The polyphenols in red wine do actually seem to be quite good for longevity. It's just more complicated than saying it's just one of them, resveratrol. But that to one side, the point is... They lived long lives where those behaviours were just 100% consistent. They had no McDonald's down the road to tempt them. They had no hypermarket to buy their junk from. And they therefore lived healthy, active lives, day in, day out, eating wholesome, diverse, but consistent diets. Their whole lives, at least the ones who lived to be 100, did. The sort of consistency that most people just can't even consider for themselves. You see videos on YouTube. I followed Brian Johnson's longevity diet for 30 days. Here's what happened. Well, guess what? Bugger all happened. Because 30 days is nothing. It's every day from now on with only very occasional cheat days, because even in the Blue Zones, they will have had celebratory meals around festivals and birthdays and that sort of thing. Think of your favourite meal. Supposing you decided to follow a regime where you allowed yourself that meal just once a year. All right, let's be wild and risky and say twice a year. You up for that? Didn't think so. And bear in mind, that's just for making the most of a standard human lifespan. The billionaires are going much bigger. And many people will say, well, what they're doing is against the natural order of things. It's much better that people don't live forever, that they have finite lifespans. They say that. Do you want to live forever? No, they say. OK. How about tomorrow? Would you like to survive tomorrow? However old you are. As so long as you're in good health, there's usually only ever one answer to that question. But there's an even more interesting side to this. 
let's take it that the buzz around this technology exists because we genuinely can see the potential that really is there. We can cure aging as though it were a disease. Logically, it's kind of exactly what it is. How will that change our societies? Supposing you can get that clinic appointment and revert your age by 10 years. And suppose you could then do it again in another 10 years. And then again, that'd be a process that could be done indefinitely. And if so, what does it mean anymore then to be human? Those billionaires investing in these companies, they are clearly hungry to benefit from it personally. And I'm not going to hold that against them. I would be perfectly happy to do that as well. But what then? I mean, they know such services will be, you know, in high demand forever. Guaranteed market. Will they be most profitable as mass production services for everyone? Or as high cost luxury services available only for those who pay a huge premium? I mean, that would get the mobs with pitchforks out onto the streets, you would think. Look at it in terms of political incentives. Older people tend to be stuck in their ways and to be resistant to change. <clears throat> what? No, not me. Other older people, obviously. They also tend to vote a lot more than younger people. Now, you hope some of them have become wise as well in the process of getting older, but there's no guarantee of that. Changing and evolving ideas often come to fruition when the previous generation dies off. It's a brutal fact of life. But imagine a society where that just didn't happen. Where the older generation just gets larger and steadfastly refuses to die. Does that mean that our societies become so chronically resistant to change that they become incapable of adapting to changing circumstances? And come to that, do younger generations become so frustrated that they become more likely to fall into radical political movements? Or maybe rejuvenated older people become less resistant to change because for the first time they realise they're going to be around to experience long-term consequences that they previously dismissed as someone else's problem. It's just the consequences of a shift like this we can only begin to imagine because it changes so much. What about authoritarian dictators? China's Xi Jinping has been basically granted leadership for life, but that was kind of assuming that life meant, at the most, another 20 years. You can bet that any dictator is going to want to be one of the beneficiaries of all of this work. So, so on and so on, and all the implications. It will arguably be the most profound change since we stepped out of caves and took up farming. And will it become politicised in the polarised world we currently live in? Well, how on earth could it not? Presumably, because human beings would all like to live longer, regardless of their politics, it probably won't be a division around the actual principle that becomes the main issue of contention. But it'll be about who controls it, to the benefit of whom, on what basis. All of these things are surely going to become the points of some savage conflicts. What can I say? Kinda hope I live long enough to see it. <laughs>